cultural baggage, custom, and tradition which prevented them from accepting the message of Islam. Break the shackles of custom and tradition. Break the shackles of desire to please ourselves and to please others. Free our minds so that we can become true Muslims. Muslims. Allah, Allah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, I greet you with the greetings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. At this time, I also send my prayers and blessings upon Allah's last and most noble prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, upon his companions, his family, wives, and those who follow right guidance. Ladies and gentlemen, today's lecture by Dr. Bilal Phillips will be on shackles of the mind. I would like to now give you a brief introduction, and it is truly a brief introduction because I, I would take up all the speaker's time were I to go through a full introduction of our brother and doctor, Sheikh Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. He was born in Jamaica, West Indies, and grew up in Canada where he accepted Islam in 1972. He completed his BA from the College of Islamic Disciplines, that is Usul din at the Islamic University of Medina in 1979, and an MA in Islamic Theology in 1985 at the University of Riyadh College of Education. In 1994, he completed his PhD in Islamic Theology or Aqida in the Department of Islamic Studies at the University of Wales. From 1994 until the year 2001, Dr. Bilal founded and directed the Islamic Information Center in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, and the Foreign Literature Department of Dar al-Fatah Islamic Press in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. In the year 2001, Dr. Bilal established the Islamic Online University, the first accredited Islamic university on the internet. He was a professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at the American University in Dubai and Ajman University, head of the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies at Preston University in Ajman, United Arab Emirates, and he is a lecturer and head of the Sharia Advisory Committee at the Qatar Guest Center in Doha, Qatar. He is currently the Dean of the Islamic Studies Academy in Doha. More information can be gained from www.islamicstudiesacademy.com. For more information on Dr. Bilal Phillips, you can look for his website, www.bilalphillips.com. That's one word, B-I-L-A-L. P-H-I-L-I-P-S dot com. He is also hosting the website www.islamiconlineuniversity.com where you can sign up for classes on Islam and listen to lectures, watch videos, and also have DVDs downloaded to your computers. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further waiting, inshallah, shackles of the mind, by Dr. Bilal Phillips. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The topic, shackles of the mind, is one which most of us would find somewhat strange. I'm sure you're probably wondering what am I going to talk about under this topic. And to be honest, when it was given to me, I was wondering myself, what was I going to be talking about? Normally, when we think of shackles, 
of the mind, meaning shackles or chains. Chains on our minds for what purpose? What is the point of these chains? Chains which would prevent us from being true Muslims. This is the take which I took from this title. What are the shackles? What are the obstacles which would prevent us from actuating our faith? Making our faith a living faith as opposed to the typical understanding of religion where people go through rituals, they do group festivals, and they socialize all in the name of religion. But are they really practicing that religion? No. We can see it with the religions around us in the world today. One only has to look at Christmas to see a classical case of religion turned into a social event. Besides the fact of truth or falsehood with regards to Christmas, but just look at the event of Christmas. What does it have to do with religion? Where is religion there? And this is not something I'm saying as a Muslim relative to Christianity. This is what Christians say themselves. Christmas has become so commercialized that the religious element has been lost. And that's why anybody, except Muslims, can celebrate Christmas. It doesn't matter what you believe. You can celebrate it. We do also even find some Muslims doing it, but they shouldn't be. But uh, that's what it has become, something. And the religion in general has become something which is social. To a certain degree, this has come, happened for Muslims too. Whether it is the event of Hajj, which is the major gathering of Muslims, or it is the event of the Eids, the festivals, to a certain degree, we have ritualized them so much so that anybody could participate. And that's why you will find non-Muslims participating in our Eids and they don't have any problem with it because to a large degree except for Salatul Eid the Eid itself has lost its religious character the fact that there is Salah there that is a reminder for us that we begin the celebration of Eid with Salah that is to keep us on track that Eid is fundamentally a religious gathering, a gathering in which we worship Allah. And everything else that takes place should be an extension of that worship. But is it? That's the question. So, going back to the shackles, the mental shackles, which prevents us from actualizing our faith. When I reflected on this topic, what came to me by Allah's mercy was Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha, which we repeat 17 times every day if we are praying five times a day which we are supposed to be in that surah Allah speaks about the shackles of the mind which prevent the believers from actuating their faith where you might ask you have read the translation of Surah Al-Fatiha and there's no mention of any shackles in it. Shackles of the mind. So where did I get that from? Well, if we read the last verse, 
Surah Al-Fatiha, we know, begins with the praise of Allah. Then, recognizing His mercy, recognizing our responsibility, Maliki Yawmiddin, that we are accountable to Allah. Then, affirming the purity of our faith, you alone do we worship, and from you alone do we seek help. Then we ask, Allah teaches us to ask for the most important thing in our lives. And that is, show us the straight path. And then we describe that path. Surat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim, the path of those who you have blessed. Because it is only with the blessings of Allah that we find that path. And what is that path? It is the path which is not followed by those on whom is Allah's anger, غير المغضوب عليهم, nor those who have gone astray, والضالين. Two categories of people who are prevented from the path, the straight path, the path of Allah. Two people, two groups of people, those on whom is Allah's anger and those who have gone astray. Prophet Muhammad explained that those on whom is Allah's anger refers primarily to the Jews. And those who have lost their way, who have gone astray, primarily are the Christians. Now, what is it about the Jews and the Christians that Allah would put them here in Surah Al-Fatiha? The Jews, when we see them described in the Quran, Allah described them, describes them as those who do not act on their knowledge. And the Christians are described as those without true knowledge. And we should keep in mind that whenever Allah describes a people in the Quran, He is describing them to the believers for them to understand the lesson, the lessons to be learned from these people. It is not so that we can say, Allah's anger is on the Jews. The Christians are astray. Well, that's true. But Allah wasn't clarifying these points for us to say that. He was clarifying in Surah Al-Fatiha these points so that we beware. We beware of falling into the same pitfalls into the same traps, the satanic traps, which causes one to be of those who know and don't act on the knowledge. Or to be ignorant and to be acting on false knowledge and thus to be astray. So the main two pitfalls, the main two shackles which chain our minds in such a way as to prevent us from becoming true Muslims, Muslims who have knowledge and who act on that knowledge. The main two shackles 
are one, not acting on knowledge, and two, not having knowledge. Now, if we put them in order, starting with knowledge first, we have to understand that there is a difference between knowledge and faith. We have to understand first and foremost that there is a difference between knowledge and faith. Well, this is an area that people become confused about. They mistake knowledge for faith. They mistake knowledge for faith. Knowledge from the Islamic perspective must precede faith. Knowledge must precede faith for faith to be correct and real. Knowledge must precede it. If faith is preceded by emotion, and we know that emotions blind, as they say, love is blind. Love is a powerful emotion. It blinds us. So where we address our faith from an emotional perspective not preceded by knowledge, then it is likely that we are on the wrong path. We're on the wrong path. We are very emotional and strong about something that we really have no knowledge of. So, knowledge should precede faith. As Allah said, فَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. We should know it. Without that knowledge, if we're just repeating it, لا إله إلا الله, we don't really know what it means. We are acting on something, probably, most probably, in the wrong way. If we are to act on it, and we don't really know what it means, then the likelihood is that we'll be acting on it in the wrong way. So, knowledge. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, enshrined knowledge in Islam following Allah's instruction, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you don't know. If you don't know, ask those who know. وَإِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء Only the knowledgeable truly fear Allah. Allah has laid that foundation already. That without real knowledge, one cannot truly fear Allah. And the way to get knowledge is to ask those who know whenever you don't know. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu made it a pillar of faith. A pillar of faith, a pillar in Islam. Meaning a foundation, one of the basic foundations for our Islam to seek knowledge. It's not of the five pillars of Islam or the six pillars of Iman, no. I'm not saying that, of those. But under, underneath the five pillars of Islam and the six pillars of Iman is the pillar of knowledge. Prophet Muhammad said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. How can we implement the five pillars of Islam or the six pillars of Iman without knowledge? So knowledge is the foundation. So Prophet Muhammad made it a faridah. What is a faridah? 
something obligatory. If you don't do it, you're in sin. So the Prophet ﷺ in that hadith made ignorance sin, made it sinful for those who have the opportunity to gain the knowledge and don't do it. It is sinful. It is something displeasing to Allah. It is something which can lead us to hell. Destroy this life. It's very serious. That's why he made seeking knowledge an obligation. Farida ala kulli Muslim. On every Muslim. According to his or her ability, naturally. What is required of a child is not required of an adult. What is required of somebody going to make Hajj is not required of somebody not going to make Hajj. So different circumstances may demand of us knowledge which other circumstances don't. But we are obliged to have the knowledge of whatever is obligatory on us. Whatever is obligatory on us at this point in time, right now, we are obliged to have the knowledge of. So if we are going to make Hajj, it, we are obliged to have knowledge of Hajj before we go to make Hajj. What do Muslims do commonly? They go and make Hajj, and then they come back and they ask people, well, Sheikh, Maulana, should I have done that? No, not when you came back. That's not the time to find out what you were supposed to have been doing. Everybody was doing this thing and I went and did that. Was that okay? No, this is not the time to ask. The time to ask was before going. The time to ask was before going. We had the fast of Ashura yesterday. This was an opportunity which Allah gave us to remove from us sins of the past. One who fasts Ashura removes from himself some of the sins of the past. Depending on the level of his fast, it may be many, they may be major, or it may be few, and they may be minor. How many of us fasted yesterday? Put your hands up. Oh, okay, maybe in India, uh, you are going according to different calendar. So you've calculated Ashura to be today. Today is Ashura. Ninth today. Woof, you're two days off. <laughs> you're always two days off, okay. We have a knowledge problem here. <laughs> anyway, those of you following the general understanding based on your own calculations here uh, for Ashura being tomorrow, inshallah you make the intention to fast tomorrow. And you should try make the intention to fast today. You should have known before today that fasting on the 10th alone is not sufficient. It's rewarded, you do get a reward for it, but the best fast is to combine the 9th along with the 10th. Tasua hmm? and Ashura. The 9th and the 10th. Why? Because Prophet Muhammad though he only fasted on the 10th, in the last year of his life said, if I live to the next year, then I will fast a day before along with it. In some narrations mentions a day after. Most commonly, a day before. In order to go along another path other than those who only fast on the 10th, who were the Jews. Yawm Kippur. They fast on the 10th. So to clarify the difference that Muslims are conscious of the difference, he said, fast another day along with it. 
And we should know what is the significance of that day. And I won't go into it because that's another lecture in and of itself. Fasting Ashura. And what it means really to fast. But that knowledge, because of the fact that Ashura is before us, an opportunity which Allah has placed in the year for us to earn for ourselves additional blessings, it is obligatory on us to have that knowledge. So as to get from that practice the full benefit. If we don't have that knowledge, we will miss the ninth today. We won't be fasting today when we should have been. And tomorrow, the 10th, we will do it in a fashion that we have always done it before without really knowing why do we fast on Ashura or how should we really fast, you know. And we just make iftar and we have a nice little gathering and another Ashura passes without us getting from it the benefit which Allah has put in it. So, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi made the seeking of knowledge obligatory on every Muslim. Of course, first and foremost it is Islamic knowledge. What prevents us from achieving that? Today, one of the biggest mental shackles which prevents us from realizing knowledge of the religion seeking that knowledge is cultural baggage what do i mean by cultural baggage tradition and custom tradition and custom which opposes the truth tradition and custom which opposes the truth. What do I mean? If we go to Surah Al-Ma'idah, fifth chapter of the Quran, verse 104, Allah says to the Prophet وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَلَى الرَّسُولُ قَالُوا حَسْبُنَا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَانَا If you, Muhammad, صلى الله عليه وسلم, Call the people to Allah and to what the Prophet yourself offers them. They will say to you what our parents were doing is sufficient for us. 1,400 years ago, when Prophet Muhammad wasallam called the people to Tawheed, to Islam, the people said, what we found our parents doing, hasbuna ma wajadna alayhi aba'ana. What we found our parents doing was sufficient for us. <clears throat> that is cultural baggage. Custom and tradition which prevented them from accepting the message of Islam. Preventing them from gaining the knowledge and applying that knowledge. Abu Talib, uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on his deathbed, after having protected, defended, supported the Prophet ﷺ. On his deathbed, when Prophet Muhammad ﷺ invited him to accept Islam, what prevented him from accepting Islam? His brothers were around him saying, are you going to give up the way of our forefathers? Are you going to dishonor our family? Are you going to... Uh, disregard our parents, our grandparents, traditions. And he submitted. He submitted to the idol of culture. 
Today, many Muslims submit to the idol of culture. So, they can't find out true Islam because they are prevented by the idol of custom and tradition. So, that topic, the importance of seeking knowledge is a massive topic. But enough for us to know that in order for us to not be astray, we must seek knowledge. It is obligatory. Not only is it obligatory, it is a bada. It is the foundation of worship and it is in itself worship. Prophet Muhammad said, Man salaka tariqan yiltamisu fi ilman sahalallahu lahu tariqan ilal jannah. Whoever takes a path in which he or she seeks knowledge, Allah will make the path to paradise easy for them. And believe me, whatever makes the path to paradise easy has to be ibadah, has to be worship, doing what is pleasing to Allah. Because that's the basic definition of worship. Basic definition of worship is doing what is pleasing to Allah. So, that is one major shackle and its sub shackles the other major shackle is that of not acting on knowledge and that is as much a problem perhaps even a bigger problem than the problem of not having knowledge in some respects it may be a bigger problem because a person may be excused in their ignorance. Maybe. Ignorance is not necessarily an excuse before Allah. If we had access and means to get the knowledge, then ignorance is not acceptable. But if we didn't have access, we didn't have opportunity, and Allah is the one who destines our circumstances of life then of course he is not going to hold us accountable there is an excuse here whereas acting on the knowledge once you have it the only excuse is your being unable to act and 99.9% .9 of the times when we don't do what we know we should be doing it is because we have chosen not to do it. Only 1% or less than 1% are we truly unable to do it. Truly. If we look into ourselves honestly, of course, we always say, I can't. The circumstances, we make all kinds of excuses, why? This, you know, I'm forced. But if we really stop and look at it, it is not about being forced. It is not about being forced. It is about choices that we make. And these choices are very dangerous choices. Choices which are in fact to do what is displeasing to Allah and preferring that over doing what is pleasing to Allah. And what does that say about faith? What does that say about faith itself? When we choose to do what we know is displeasing to Allah over what is pleasing to Allah. Yesterday in my talk, I spoke about Muslim dress. When we see sisters who are not dressing according to Muslim dress, and we ask them, sister, why don't you dress according to Muslim dress? After the knowledge has come to you, 
she will say, it's not pleasing to my husband. It's not pleasing to my family. It's not pleasing to the society. My neighbors, at my people at work or at school or whatever, the society doesn't like when I dress that way. So I dress this other way, the traditional way. And the same thing with the brothers. When we ask them, brothers, you already know that salah is not acceptable if your aura is exposed. The brothers say, well, you know my job. They require me to dress like this. Yeah, I know I shouldn't, but it's my job. Or, you know, that kind of dress is looked down on in the society. You know, people look at the person as being backwards. You know, they're dressing like people dressed 25 years ago, 50 years ago, baggy pants and these kind of things. You know, it's just not smart looking. It's very serious. Because, as I said yesterday, every school of thought, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali, all say that one of the conditions for the acceptability of Salah after facing the Qibla, praying in a clean place, having a state of purity, Tahara is Satrul Aura, covering the private parts. And for a man that is between the navel and the knee, and covering does not mean simply having cloth on it. Because if that cloth is see-through, what if you wore a pair of pants that are see-through? And believe me, a time is coming. A time is coming when that will be in fashion, to walk around with see-through pants. If you wore see-through pants, would your aura be considered covered? No. Your aura would not be considered covered. We all agree on that one. If you wore pants, which are spandex pants, spandex is like what the bicycle, the guys who ride bicycles in bicycle races, and what people are wearing now in the Olympics, that's why we shouldn't be watching the Olympics, because the runners, what are they wearing? What kind of shorts are they wearing now? These are shorts which are sprayed on, spray on shorts, skin tight, exposing the aura. Can you pray in such pants? No. Prayer would not be acceptable. And of course, that requirement is not only in salah, it is whenever you're outside in the public. When your aura should be covered. So it's not just salah, because some brothers would say, when the time for salah comes at work, I have a longi, you know, I put on my longi and I make my salah, aura covered. Alhamdulillah, that's better than not. Alhamdulillah, that is better than not. Because at least for your salah, you are protecting your salah to that degree. But still, after you take the long giaf off, is Allah only watching you when you're in salah? Outside of salah, you are still under the command to cover your aura. This is part of the male hijab. So what stops us? And no, Allah said in Surah As-Saf, 61st chapter, verse 3, Ya ayyulidhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'alu. O you who believe, why do you not do what you say? Why do you say what you don't do? You say that satr al-awra is compulsory. Covering your privates is obligatory, but you don't do it. Kabura maqtan indallahi an taqulu ma la taf'alun. 
It is a great sin in the sight of Allah that you say what you don't do. That you say what you don't do. That was the curse which fell on the Jews, which made them maghdubi alayhim. And all of us that do that, we fall under the same category of the maghdubi alayhim. And know that the main shackle, sub-shackle, which prevents us from acting on our knowledge is what? Desires. Hawa. And as Allah said, have you not seen the one who makes his desires his God? Have you not seen the one who makes his desires his God? That's what we have done. How did Satan get Adam and Eve to disobey Allah? They were in a garden filled with trees. They could eat from any of the trees, but one tree, Allah said, don't eat from it. One tree. How did Satan get them? And Allah warned them about Satan. How did Satan get them to eat from that tree? He played on their desires. He said, as is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, 7th chapter verse 20 وَمَا نَهَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمَا عَنْ هَذِي الشَّجْرَةَ إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَا مَلَكَيْنِ أَوْ تَكُونَا مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ He said to them, Your Lord only prohibited you from eating from this tree so that you would not become like angels or that you would be eternal that you would not become like the angels completely good free from any sin or that you be of the eternals you never die and with that Adam and Eve ate from the tree. He played on their desires. And that's what we do, isn't it? Satan plays on our desires. Our desires to want to look good. Our desires to want to please family, please friends, please our boss, please this one, please the other one. So in doing that, we choose to please our human compatriots. People in this life, human beings, we choose to please them over pleasing Allah. And what is that but shirk? What is that but shirk? It is shirk. So though as Muslims we say we don't practice shirk, that's what the others do. In fact, we are committing shirk in this act. I'm not saying that we've become mushriks, right? Because not every act of shirk makes a person a mushrik. It is an act of idolatry, but it doesn't mean you become an idolater. So I'm going to call you an idol worshiper. No. But understand that in its essence, it is shirk. Choosing to please human beings over pleasing Allah. Meaning, choosing you to please human beings and displeasing Allah is shirk. And it is caused by our worship of our desires. Our submission to our desires. This is the challenge. This is the challenge before us today. For us to actuate Islam, to make it a living faith, we must have knowledge of that faith. We must know Islam. Not as it has been handed to us by our parents, 
because our parents were not Sahaba. They did not learn Islam from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so that we can say, but that's what our parents told us. No. We are obliged to follow Islam which was brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the Islam. So if our parents weren't Sahaba, then we can't use the excuse, well that's what my parents taught me. So we are obliged to seek the correct knowledge of Islam. And secondly, when we acquire that knowledge, we are obliged to act on it, to earn the pleasure of Allah. To make it worship, to turn that act of seeking knowledge into faith. We have to act on it. To earn the pleasure of Allah, the reward for practicing the deen, we have to break those shackles. Break the shackles of custom and tradition and habit. Break the shackles of desire to please ourselves and to please others. Free our minds so that we can become true Muslims. This is the challenge before us today, my brothers and sisters. It is a great challenge. And it is what distinguishes between us and the first generation. That generation which Prophet Muhammad called the best of generations. Khairun nasi qarni. The best of generations, the best of people are my generation. Thumma alladheena yalunahum, thumma alladheena yalunahum. Then those who follow them, then those who follow them. The first three generations were the best. Why? What made them the best? Because they sought knowledge. They sought knowledge from the sources. They gained it from the pure source and they acted on it. They acted on that knowledge. That was what distinguishes them from us. But each and every one of us has the ability to rise to their level. They, each and every one of us has the ability to rise to the level of the Sahaba with regards to knowledge and practice. With regards to knowledge and practice. We cannot equal them in the sense of seeing Rasulullah Maybe we might see him in a dream. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that if we see Rasulullah in a dream, he sees him in a dream, then he has seen Rasulullah. But there are issues concerning that. Very few people are blessed with that. So we can't equal them in that sense, in general. But we can equal them in the sense of seeking knowledge. In fact, the knowledge has been gathered for us in a way that it was not for them. When you read about the lives of Imam Abu Hanifa, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and the early scholars, those who gathered hadith, Imam Bukhari and that, they struggled, they strove, they traveled to get that knowledge. Now we have it all together in books, CDs, it's all there. So it is much easier for us. And then there is acting on that knowledge. Everybody is equal in that regard. You can act or not act. You can choose to act or choose not to act. So, in that sense, we are all in a position to achieve the status of the Sahaba with regards to our faith. And that's why scholars are agreed that though Prophet Muhammad said the best of generations is my generation, the Sahaba, 
It doesn't mean that there were not individuals from the generation after better than those of his generation. He spoke about the generation as a whole. But they were of different levels. So there can be in the generations after individuals who were greater than those who were of that generation. Not greater than Abu Bakr, because the Prophet ﷺ said about him that he was the best of his nation. But of the general Sahaba, who were on a variety of different levels, it is possible. But you will find scholars living amongst us in this generation today, who were on a level greater than them. It's possible, as individuals. So the challenge is there. The challenge of faith is there for us. To break the shackles on our minds. To free ourselves from the satanic chains which prevent us from making our faith a living, real faith. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Bala Phillips, inshallah, for that lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we'll go into the question and answer session. There are a few rules which I will briefly mention in order to do this in an, in an orderly manner. We have two microphones placed in this hall, one here in the front for the brothers, microphone number one and in the front of the sister section, microphone number two. I ask that when you approach the microphone, you stand in one line, forming a queue, and do not bunch up around the microphone. Follow any instructions given to you by the microphone attendants. You may ask one question and one question only. Your question should be on the topic. If you have a second question, please go to the rear of the line. And if you come back to the microphone, you may ask your second question. Written questions will take second priority. So if you write down your question, it's better to try and find someone else to ask the question for you. As always, in these events, we encourage the non-Muslims to ask questions, to make comments, or to give some kind of comments, you know, criticisms that they may have heard in the talk and may have misunderstood. Sometimes, and I'm talking now to the non-Muslims, what you think would be a criticism that we would object to, is sometimes it's something that we would actually agree with. Anything that you say will be taken in a spirit of kindness and mutual interfaith dialogue, and no one will become angry with you. We will not become angry with you because of something that you asked or said in order to gain clarification. That's what the purpose of us inviting you to the microphone is. Ladies and gentlemen, inshallah, we will begin now. I encourage anyone who's sitting next to a non-Muslim to please try to motivate that non-Muslim to uh, ask a question. And for the non-Muslims here in the audience, if you have a question, simply go to any of the volunteers which you'll find in the aisles or in the center aisle and tell them you have a question, they will assist you in getting to the front of the line so that you may ask your question. Okay? You don't have to wait in the line. Just make sure one of the volunteers helps you and you'll come to the front of the line and you may ask your question. With no further delays, inshallah, if our speaker is ready, we'll start question and answer. Could you please state your name and occupation, sister? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, my name is Asma and I'm a teacher. How do I react to my friend who says that ignorance is better than gaining knowledge and not acting on it because gaining knowledge and not acting on it is a greater sin. Okay, there is a famous saying in the West when I grew up, people would say ignorance is bliss. That's how they put it. Ignorance is bliss. When you don't know what is required of you, then you're not required. So you can live an easy life. You don't know you have to pray five times a day, you don't have to pray. It makes life easy, doesn't it? But this is a satanic statement. This is one of the ways that Satan deludes people into not seeking correct knowledge. No, 
if you are able to seek knowledge and you choose not to, you carry the full sin. So don't think that because I didn't find out, because that, that happens sometimes. You want to tell somebody about something which is wrong. They say, no, no, don't tell me, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Because if I don't know, then it's okay. I can keep on doing what I'm doing. Right? No. It doesn't work like that. Right? If you are driving down the road beyond the speed limit, and there were signposts, there were posts which said what the speed limit was, the police stop you. Can you say, I was ignorant. I didn't see the signposts. You know? They say, no. Ignorance is not an excuse before the law. That's what they tell you. And know that it's the same thing before Allah. Ignorance is not an excuse before Allah if you had the means to get the knowledge. Brother, could you please state your name and occupation? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am SMA Sayyid Saul Hamid. I am doing my master's degree in computer applications. Uh, my question is uh, what kind of knowledge we need and what we do to get to perform our salah with concentration? Okay. We are sort of off the topic a little bit, but anyway, uh, what kind of knowledge is, should be given priority? It should be obviously religious knowledge, because that is for both this life and the next. Included in that knowledge that we need to seek is also knowledge of this world. As you are seeking computer studies, it is something that we need for the functioning of society, functioning of life here today. So it is a valid area to seek knowledge in also. How to seek correct knowledge about Salah in, in order to make uh, the Salah the best way? Well, Prophet ﷺ said, Sallu kamara aytumuni usalli. Pray as you saw me pray. So we need to know how did the Prophet ﷺ pray? Externally. That's where we start from. Externally, how did he pray? Now, it may involve some small things that we might say, well, that's not so big. Now, some people, when they're going to raise their hands, they raise it and touch their ears, right? As if they want to make sure that their ears are still on the head, right? You touch your ear or something like this before. Of course, there is no mention in the description of the Prophet's prayer that he touched his ears, you know? No mention. It just said, he raised his hands to the level of his ears. Or to the level of his shoulders. And this is just an example I'm giving, right? And one might say, but you know, what's the big deal? If you touch your ears, or you put your hand here, what's the big deal? Well, the Prophet ﷺ said, pray as you saw me pray. If it wasn't important, he wouldn't have said that. Right? That's what we have to believe. It is important. Because he didn't say things which weren't important. He was sent by Allah to tell us the important things. So if he said, pray as you saw me pray, then that's what we should do. Isn't it? So we don't say this is not important. No. If he said, what, pray as you saw me pray, then we try to do it as closely as possible. Externally and internally. So he gave us advice in terms of when we're praying, if things happen which might distract us from our prayer, what we should do. And so, so we read about the prayer. We study the prayer. We should know the prophetic way of prayer. Because it was the best way to pray. Okay? Inshallah. Thank you for the question. Sister, your name and occupation? Yeah, uh, my name is Sabrine. I'm doing mechanical engineering. I just wanted to ask, it's relating to the topic only, that one of the biggest shackles that youth face is uh, being attached to this world and the possessions of this world. So anything that Rasulullah said in his hadith regarding refraining from, you know, what can we do not to be attached to this world? Of course, it's personal uh, jihad, but something else. You know, with that. Thank you. Okay. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had warned us about how we use our time. He said, Ni'matani maghbunun fihi ma kathirun min nas There are two blessings about which people are deluded. 
Most people are deluded. As-sihhatu wal faragh Good health and spare time. So, what we need to help the youth is to get them involved, to be involved in activities which would make use of their health. While they're healthy, they can do things and make use of their time. So they don't have so-called spare time, time to kill. You know, as they said that the idle mind is the devil's workshop, right? You have spare time, then shaitan will come and give you things to do which are not good things. So we try to occupy, get them involved in activities, find ways and means to have them actively occupied in beneficial things. If we're able to do that, then we're able to help them a long way. But it's when we are too busy, we don't have time, we leave them with the television, you know, we leave them with whatever, hanging out with their friends, just running out and playing outside, wasting time, you know, in a bad environment, this is where they go astray because that environment is calling to materialism, to be caught up in it, to love it, to sacrifice for it, you know, to make it very dear to the heart. So I would, that's my advice in terms of utilizing time effectively. So we talk about time management for our children. We can't leave it up to them to manage their time. They're children. And it's the nature of children to waste time in foolish pursuits. Whatever pleases them. They're young. So we have to guide them. We have to find for them alternatives. Because it's not just don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do the other. No, we have to say, instead of doing this, let us do this. Instead of doing that, let us do the other. Thank you. Brother, could you please state your name and occupation? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Munir Ahmad. I'm a tax consultant. My question is, the educated people can seek knowledge as they know from where to seek the knowledge. But for a common person, when I advise to a common person, as you said, they simply reject me. So how can I reach them? Well, now you're addressing an issue of da'wah. That is the issue of da'wah. How do you give da'wah to people? You know, how do you invite people to knowledge? There are a variety of different principles governing it. One very important principle is that you have to win over hearts. Because when you're dealing with ignorant people, then you have to win over their hearts. They have to feel confidence in you. They have to have a love for you, to be able to listen to you. If they don't know you from any place, they don't have any special concern, etc. for you, then your words are just words. They don't want to hear it. So when you're working with people who are from not an educated level, then you have to work on an emotional level. You have to establish a bridge between yourself and them. And that is one of love. That you treat them in a nice way, you speak to them in a nice way, you build a relationship with them, and then you try to introduce that knowledge to them gradually. But if you just come to them, no haram, shirk, so and so, then of course you will not be very successful. Thank you for the question. Sister, could you please state to her question, please? Assalamu alaikum, brother. This is a question from a non Muslim sister. She asked, uh, When a man can get married to many women, why not a woman can do it? Okay, this is an issue of knowledge here. Um, why a woman cannot marry many men? Because it is the nature, fundamentally, of men and women that Allah created them in such a way that the woman attaches herself to one man. And men can have the attachment to more than one woman. That is a part of their nature that Allah has created them with. And that nature matches the reality of a surplus of women in the world and a minority of men, which is the norm in the world. So it, it is a characteristic which matches a societal need. Also, it addresses the basic need of a person desire of a person to want to know who his parents are. 
If a man has four wives, they all get pregnant and they all have children, every one of them can say, I'm your mother and that is your father. But if a woman has four husbands, she gets pregnant, has a child, what does she say to the child? I'm your mother and one of these four guys is your father. Naturally, he's good. the child is not going to feel good with that. One of them, how do I decide which one? People might say, oh, we have DNA testing. No, DNA is for a very small proportion of people in this world. The vast majority of people have no opportunity to have DNA testing to see who could have been and who couldn't have been. So that's normal and natural. So polygamy was instituted by God to serve a need in the society. Serve a need, which is basically to absorb surplus women into family halal family circumstances and to avoid them falling into corruption in order to fulfill their natural desires of wanting to have love and to have family, to have a husband, etc. Okay? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashadu ala ila ila ant, nastaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. We ask Allah to bless us with knowledge and the courage and faith to act on that knowledge. Assalamu alaikum.